Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar presented by the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation and the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. This program is being recorded and will be available to reference later today. My name is Sheena Simmons. I'm a research associate at the NCPTT and I'll be moderating today. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to share a couple of technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. You can use the chat box to say hello, ask questions, and share information. If you post a question in the chat box, you'll receive a response from me. Any questions will be noted, and I will verbally ask them to our presenters toward the end of the program. At the bottom of your screen is a box labeled Web Links. You can click on the title to highlight it in blue, and then click the Browse To button in order to be taken directly to the site. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our presenters, Fran Ritchie and Julia Sabalski. Fran Ritchie is an assistant conservator in anthropology objects conservation at the American Museum of Natural History. Prior to that, she worked in the museum's Natural Science Collections Conservation Lab as a project conservator for an IMLS grant-funded project researching materials used to conserve historic taxidermy. Her work expands upon previous experiences preserving taxidermy specimens across the United States from Alaska and Wyoming to Ohio and Illinois. She is a graduate of the Art Conservation Program at the State University College at Buffalo, holds a Master of Arts in Museum Anthropology from Columbia University, and a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of, Bachelors of Arts in both Art Conservation and Anthropology from the University of Delaware. She is a professional associate at the IC. Julia Sabalski is a Senior Associate Conservator of Natural Science Collections at the American Museum of Natural History, where she began working in January 2010. Her present efforts support the ongoing care of the museum's scientific collections, habitat dioramas, and other science materials on exhibit, including risk assessment and new research of special importance to natural history materials. Julia received her undergraduate degrees in fine art and anthropology from Washington University in St. Louis, and a Master of Arts in Art History and Certificate in Conservation from the Conservation Center of the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, where she and Fran co-taught an advanced conservation graduate course in Conservation Strategies for Natural Science Collections. Prior to working at the American Museum of Natural History, Julia interned and worked in various museums, including the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and the New Bedford Whaling Museum. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Fran and Julia. All right. Thank you so much. Um, this is Fran. I will be presenting first, um, and then I will hand over the mic to Julia. We have a lot to cover today. I think this is a pretty rich topic, um, and we're excited to be talking about it. We've divided the webinar into three different sections. The first one's going to be a general taxidermy background, um, and then preventive measures you can take to protect your collection from water damage. And then finally, what to do if disaster does strike and you need to recover your specimens. I want to give a general taxidermy background because you need to know how taxidermy is constructed in order to understand its weaknesses and the special considerations that they require. The thing that confuses people the most um, when I talk to them about taxidermy, about what I do, is that uh, they don't understand what's inside of it and how it's made. Uh, even It's been surprising to me, even my hunter friends who get their own animals mounted don't even know what goes into creating a mount, so I think it's really important. Um, the different types of mounts that you usually encounter are shoulder and trophy mounts that you can see here. You see that lovely bison mounted on the wall at um, Sagamore Hill, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's historic home. And um, you can see in the photos on the left, the specimens, um, sometimes they have a wooden panel display board behind them, like on the moose, and sometimes they don't, like the ram. And these are... Um, full body mounts and they are mounted to different bases. Um, the one on the left is a plain display base that's just nice and fancy. Um, in some collections these are historic mounts that um, were made many years ago uh, in the last century. And then other times you'll see them attached to display bases um, that are supposed to replicate their habitat, uh, where they came from. And in the top one, that one, that branch, looks like perhaps it was deinstalled from a diorama or from an exhibit at some point. But um, the mallard on the bottom, that habitat base was um, created on its own just to have a habitat base uh, for its display. 
And then this black-footed ferret uh, is a full-body mount that was removed from a diorama, so it has no display base at all. And you can see the internal wires that are protruding out of the legs in the blue circle. Those are used to attach it to the base, um, in this case is the diorama, um, but sometimes you can then use that to attach it to a display base or the habitat bases like we saw in the previous photo. And you'll note um, in the top photo that when it was removed from the diorama, uh, it was then inserted into foam supports, which are an easy way to create a temporary base when you're um, having to work on these specimens. All right, but how are they made? Um, taxidermy is defined as preserved skin that's mounted or attached to an internal support that poses it in a lifelike position. The internal support is re often referred to as the mannequin. And there are many, many different ways that taxidermists and even kind of wannabe taxidermists have attempted to construct these mannequins throughout the centuries. So you never quite know what you're going to encounter. Uh, the first two techniques that you see on this very rudimentary timeline um, were not super successful. Uh, the wooden frame that you see the horse and um, then stuffing methods like the walrus. Um, and the walrus is actually a really great story. Um, as you can tell, the taxidermist who mounted that had never seen a walrus in, in life before. Um, that specimen was brought back during an expedition, so he didn't know how much to stuff it, and he just stuffed it until the skin completely stretched out. So it's not um, indicative of what the species looks like in real life, um, but the museum in the UK um, has not changed this mount because it's kind of, you know, shows the history of it. Um, but the stuffing method is when taxidermists would just kind of gather up anything that they had lying around and stuff out the skin um, until it was full. So as you can see, does not produce a very good result. The three most common way techniques that we see in museums are these last three. Um, and you also find these in private collections. So I'm going to focus on those today. Um, and then I want to point out too uh, that this timeline represents approximate dates that are different techniques that were used, but um, they continue to be used uh, past the dates on the timeline. So some of these you still might see today, um, so, such as stuffing or the binding. Right, the first one is probably the most um, common because it's a very accessible way to make a mount, um, and many birds and small mammals are still constructed in this way. This is the binding and wrapping method. Um, in this one, you create the muscles of the animal by binding or wrapping loose material over an internal frame that's constructed of metal or wood or bone or a combination of all of those. And a very common material that you'll find um, is called excelsior or wood wool or a variety of different names. And that's, uh, those are really fine slivers or fine shavings of, wo of wood. And you can see in the photos on the left, um, there's a lot of loose material as well as a bound mannequin that represents the carcass of a bird. And the, the photo right below that one um, indeed has the bird carcass sitting right below its mannequin that was formed using the binding method. Um, but you can also uh, construct larger animals out of this. And um, the image on the right is a little rat um, that I made during a rogue taxidermy class. And you can see that there's a metal rod sticking out of my little wood wool bound popsicle. Um, and so the, the rod helps create the frame that the, the loose material is bound over. Um, mounts that are constructed in this way can be very successful if you're good at binding to create those muscles, but they can be very heavy and there are many components to the mount. So they may respond differently to changes in the environment. And if you think about it, you know, a big form that's full of condensed wood wool, if that gets soaked, it will take a very long time to dry out and can cause problems. The next one um, is what commercial taxidermists today are most likely to use, and these are polyurethane foam mannequins that are prefabricated by taxidermy supply companies. And what you do is you, um, you measure your animal carcass, and then you go online and you buy um, a form that's similar to the size of your animal. And then once you receive it, you can make adjustments to fit your actual skin by carving the foam or by adding your own binding materials. And um, this can be very nice because it creates lighter mannequins and they might not soak up as much water because of the density of the polyurethane foam. 
but the foam itself will deteriorate over time, especially if it's not mixed well when it's made. And a good example of this, um, if any of you have some old headsets that had foam components or outdoor furniture that had foam padding, um, if you've had these for many decades, you'll know that they deteriorate over time and they yellow and they just kind of crumble away. So that can happen inside your taxidermy mount as well. I found this, um, this photo. This is from the White Memorial Conservation Center, a natural history museum. It's a really great image of the two different techniques that I just talked about. The one on the left is the bound method. You can see the wood wool body, but then they used um, cotton around the legs and the neck. Um, but you can see how you can see the, the wire that's protruding out for the tail. So they had their little wood wool popsicle, just like the rat that I pointed out. And what's great about this one is that they use the original skull of the animal. And so uh, you can see that was built on there. And there is like a modeling clay type substance that's in the eye socket. And then they inserted a plastic or a glass eye to form the mount. But then in the center, you can see the difference between um, the bound one and the polyurethane foam. That's the foam, and so they didn't include the original skull in this one. Um, you can do that. You could, they could have cut off the foam head and used the actual skull, but they chose not to. But they still have that clay material with the eyes embedded inside. And they also still um, have that metal wire that's protruding out that they would have added themselves um, drilling into it. And then finally on the right, you see the squirrel as finished. And um, you can just barely make out in this photo, um, you can see little dots that are pins that are around the eyes and around the little um, paws, and that's to hold the skin in place while it's drying. And finally, um, what we have uh, many times in museums is uh, the hollow cast technique. Um, this is what master taxidermists uh, might still use today because it creates very realistic mounts, um, but it's very time consuming, which is why a lot of people will go with the polyurethane foam mounts. This technique was created during the heyday of natural history museums when um, lots of dioramas were being built and collecting taxidermy was more popular and more accessible. And um, it was a really um, great rise. It uh, created more sculptural uh, taxidermy mounts. So the first thing you do then is um, you sculpt the animal form using the original bones and measurements of the animal. And then in photo number two, you take a mold, make a mold of that sculpture. And then in number three, you cast that mold by building it up um, in a paper mache technique. Um, and the paper mache could be um, literally paper and different adhesives, but it could also be layers of things like burlap and plaster or plaster-like substances. Um, so you're never, sometimes you're not exactly sure uh, what was used. And the results are really great. Not only is it sculptural, like I said, but it also creates a really lightweight mannequin, which is especially good for really large mounds like elephants and giraffes or seals, um, because the weight of the mannequin then won't cause damage to the, the thin skin of the animal. But of course, depending on what materials that were used to create that mache, it might be penetrable by water. If you use that paper versus that plaster-like mixture, um, the paper will absorb water in a water event. And I'd like to everyone to take note um, to the last photo, number six, where they're draping the skin to the mount over the form, um, to mount it over the form. Um, this photo really illustrates why I've been referring to all of these as taxidermy mounts and not as stuffed animals. Um, if you call it a stuffed animal, then it really truly refers to the technique that we saw earlier on that walrus, which is not accurate to this art form. Um, I get very offended when people call them stuffed animals when they're actually these beautiful works of art. And here's a slide of some extras. Um, I just mentioned the main categories, but people have used and continue to use a variety of materials. Um, I've come across a leatherback turtle that had fiberglass as the stuffing on the inside as the bound material, um, so you really never know. Uh, the boar that's in the top or left corner, um, that has a plaster-like um, head, but then a body covered in burlap. Um, I didn't really investigate it too much, but that was in an, um, a vintage antique store in Austin and was being sold for like $200, which is really crazy. Uh, the giraffe right below it, you'll, you might be able to notice, um, has a solid plaster mannequin, which makes it very heavy and very unwielding, um, and that can cause damage just because it's so heavy. Um, and we've also come across solid wax forms that are also heavy.
Uh, I wanted to include the middle image, that back of a trophy mount, because I often get asked what it, what it looks like when you take a trophy mount off the wall. And you can see that um, whatever the internal support is inside of this one, it's all attached to that wooden board. And then the preserved skin is then nailed across that board. Um, and this board doesn't extend out um, beyond the animal like that moose panel that I showed you earlier. And then the photo on the right of that primate, you can see um, pretty well the different finishing materials that are added by the taxidermist to create a more lifelike animal. Um, in this particular one, there's wax, there's paint, um, the glass and plastic eyes kind of count in this. Um, there could be real or fake teeth. Um, this one was real. Um, and then I've also come across things like um, rubber that was used to replace some of the skin in um, the feet of an, an, of an orangutan. So you really never know, and you have to kind of um, look at them carefully to see what you have. All right, not only do the techniques vary, but also the way that people have prepared the skin to mount it over the mannequin. Um, the reason why you want to have a skin preparation, why you want to preserve the skin, is that you want to prevent it from rotting. Uh, you want to dry it out to prevent feather or hair loss, and you want to help prevent against pest damage. Um, to do this, you need to scrape the flesh side of the skin to remove all the soft tissues like fat or muscle or ligaments, and then you want to wash it out or maybe pickle it using chemicals um, to degrease it. And then you apply it once it's ready, uh, or you apply a preservative or a tanning agent. I'll talk about those in a second. Um, so, or right now, these range from simple preservatives that um, are basically things just to dry out the skin a little bit more. Um, so chemical pickling, um, like I mentioned, um, or using an arsenic soap, or today it's very common for small animals, especially birds, that you would just use borax and spread that on the inside of the skin. Um, and then it ranges to using semi-tanning agents um, like alum tawing that help preserve the skin, but they don't have that long-term stability that comes from cross-linking in a full tan. Um, so the full tan that we've encountered has been vegetable tan tanning or chrome tan, and then there are just a variety of any other commercially available tanning agent um, that are available to taxidermists or um, fur places that will tan it for you. And I have a big star by it because um, I just want to point out um, it's once you think about it, of course, like in a water damage event or a water event, um, the amount of damage that you'll have on a specimen probably will also depend on um, not only how it was mounted, but um, how that skin was prepared. So if it wasn't a true tan, if it was just a pickle or you just use borax, it might um, really soak up all that water and, and reverse. And Julia will hit on that a little bit more. <clears throat> Hopefully all of you have heard about the hazards of arsenic and arsenical soap. Uh, not only was this used as a skin preservative for, um, for the animals, but it also had the added, added bonus of deterring pests. Um, they were, the arsenic soap preparation was a guarded secret, all those recipes, um, but that was prior to 1803. Um, at that time then someone did finally um, publish it. Um, and the soap was mixed in a variety of different ways. I've come across old recipe books that list about seven different ways that you can apply it or that you can mix it up, um, but it was always applied to the inside of the skins before mounting it. Um, arsenic is a heavy metal, so sometimes you might see it coming out of the seams or around the eyes or the mouth as white or gray particulates. Um, but then again, sometimes um, borax is also a white particulate, so you, you kind of need to know the history of your taxidermy to, to know whether or not it's arsenic or borax, or you can use um, testing methods to find out. Um, it's poisonous to pests, but it's also poisonous to humans, um, so it can be a skin irritant, um, it's carcinogenic, uh, it's really not good for you, and people used to use it in the textile, wallpaper, and artificial flower industry as um, in dye or pigment form. Um, and so they knew even at the time, back in the day, you can see in this illustration, that it was harmful for humans, but I guess that was before OSHA and <laughs> sometimes they just didn't care. Um, and in fact, I even came across um, some advertisements for women and men to ingest it for youth and beauty. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I'm not sure if the slides are all jumbled up on what you guys are seeing as well. Um, our screen is a wider screen than maybe what you're seeing, so if the words are jumbled, sorry about that.
So then, um, because of this arsenic, you want um, you want to protect yourself from the taxidermy. So oftentimes, when you talk to collections managers and conservators, we always say, "Oh, you want to protect the object from you and the oils in your hands, or if your hands are sweaty or whatever." And that's certainly true in this. Um, but in this case, you also need to protect yourself from the object. Um, so when you're handling taxidermy, especially a historic collection. Um, because arsenic did eventually um, fall out of favor of being used because of the health risks, but um, but you never know. You want to assume that pesticides are present, and it's not just arsenic. I should say um, there is a long history of use of several different types of residual pesticides that could still be um, on your mounts, even if they're vapor based. So the um, personal protective equipment that you would want to use your PPE, always nitrile gloves. Um, a lab coat or an apron so that you can take that off and um, wash it and you won't be taking home arsenic particulates on yourself. Um, you want to wear a respirator or a dusk mask and since these are heavy metals um, sometimes you know it's okay just to wear a dusk mask because they're not going to be necessarily floating up in the air. Um, you don't want to put your face in the fur um, but you know the dust mask will uh, help protect you but if you are in an enclosed room or you're handling lots of specimens then of course it is better to just be you know better be safe than sorry and go ahead and wear a respirator you'll also want to wear a respirator during a water event because you never really know what you're going to be encountering um, a Tyvek suit can also be really handy um, you can throw that away if it does get contaminated so you don't have to worry about uh, washing it and it can protect you everywhere you want to label specimens that do test positive for pesticides or if you have if you think that they are going to um, if, if you have suspicions that they have uh, pesticides on them go ahead and label them so people know and you want to label the storage spaces as well um, and this will help um, with future staff and visitors who are working in that area so that they know to be careful and to always wash their hands afterwards even if you're wearing gloves um, when you're working with the pieces, um, you want, besides wearing your PPE, you want to limit your working time in the spaces. Um, if you're treating them, uh, then you want to treat them in a well-ventilated space or under a fume hood. You want, always want to use a HEPA vacuum because um, the it doesn't uh, emit exhaust like other non-HEPA vacuums um, so that everything's contained. And you might want to use designated tools that you store in enclosed containers to prevent cross-contamination. When you display them, you want to keep this in mind as well. Um, you don't want to use um, pe the pesticide containing objects for your hands-on programming to help protect the public. And you also wouldn't want to, um, you want to store or display them out of public reach or ideally put them in enclosed cases. All right, so that's how you protect yourself. Um, now, how do you protect the taxidermy? Um, in general preparedness, we're going to talk about how to handle taxidermy under normal circumstances, but then we will also be um, touching on how to handle it um, when there has been a water event. For handling, um, it's really important to examine the specimen um, before you move it. So you want to identify any protruding components that might catch on things or be cumbersome if you're moving it, especially long tails or really sharp claws or really big ears. Um, look for weak, fragile, or broken areas, areas where there's already damage, like if you see a really big split in a hide. And then locations where it should be um, supported. So if there's already a display base, um, then you want to use that um, as long as the attachment to the display base is stable. Um, otherwise, as you see in this image, there aren't display bases on these taxidermy pieces, so she's handling it by the torso. She's not using the tail to hold it. She's not um, picking it up by the legs. And then before you move the specimen anywhere, you want to check for items on yourself that might knock the specimen, such as a long necklace or a large belt, um, large belt buckles, or um, back in the day, I used to tell people to watch out for walkie-talkies, so if you're still using those, watch out for that. Um, you want to wear your PPE during handling as well, such as those nitrile gloves. And you want to know your route um, so that you know that there are no obstructions or hazards, because you could be walking down the hall and then, whoops, actually someone has a... A chair there that you'll need to move but you don't have a, an extra set of hands so make sure you know your route and also make sure you have a pre-cleared space um, where you want to set down the specimen once you bring it to your location and you might need to have um, materials around that are ready to support the specimen if it doesn't have um, a display base or a handy way to set it down like in this photo 
You'll want to have things like foam pieces or weights or blankets um, to help pad it out. All right, we're going to have a video of some handling. Um, let's see how this works. Okay, so you, here you see a cart full of um, mostly birds, um, but there's a small mammal on the tray as well. I'm going to speed this up just a little bit, so it's going to look a little stop animation-like. Um, but here, the small mammal it's, um, was transported in a small tray. It doesn't have a display base, but it does rest pretty nicely on one side. That is mashing down the hairs a little bit. Um, it would probably be better if we put something softer around it. These birds on the branch, everything's pretty stable. That was taken off display, and so they inserted the branch on a piece of foam. Um, this is a custom tray that was built for this nest with a bird that helps you move it by the tray only. Um, these are some bean bags or um, bags full of shot or sand that we can use. Um, this bird is supported by individual pieces of foam since it doesn't have a good resting point on it. And then finally, this one um, also does not have a super great resting point. So by using that large bean bag, we're able to make a little nestled crate for it, or nestled spot for it, and it can rest just on the wood alone and not mess up the feathers. Okay. And then we'll go back to the presentation. Perfect. All right, and then how to store it. Um, you want to store your taxidermy ideally in enclosed cabinets. Um, I know that's not really possible for those of you from small places uh, where you have everything on display or if you're a private collector. Um, but if you don't have it on display, you want to store it enclosed somewhere to help protect it from water. Um, you want to store it in its original position, um, as in resting on the side that it's supposed to rest on or supposed to be displayed on, which can be a little bit difficult if it's really large. Use additional supports, as we said. Um, and then if they're very large and they can't be in a container, uh, in an enclosed space, you could um, store it covered in plastic um, for extra protection. But you want to beware that this could eventually crush um, any delicate areas like ears or hairs um, over the long term. So make sure that you see that. Um, and then shoulder mounts, you can put, um, those are good to uh, store on a wall covered with protect protective sheeting as well. And then <laughs> this is um, one of uh, a picture from just a storage, an enclosed storage cabinet as, um, as it was opened. And you can see that trophy mount, even though ideally it's better to have it on the wall. Um, in this instance, we weren't able to do that. So we rested it on um, the, the easiest point for it to be rested on, which is the horns, the really heavy horns. Um, and then the, the top of that um, um, display, the wooden display on the back. Um, the full body mount, uh, the deer in the middle, that was taken from a diorama, and so it just has metal wires protruding, and they were stuck into foam pieces and then weighted with some weights to make sure that it didn't topple over. And then the full body mount on the far right, um, that did have a habitat base, and so that could just kind of be on the shelf as it is. Um, ideally, though, we would add an additional protective tray so that it wouldn't knock into other things and cause damage on the habitat base. And how to display it. Um, you want to um, avoid potentially wet areas. So this is especially if you're a homeowner um, and you want to display your taxidermy. Um, you want to really think about where you want to put it in, in your house. Um, you don't want to have it on the basement floor in case there's flooding. You don't want to have it under a pipe um, that, has, that has water running through it um, or directly under a sprinkler. Um, if you put it, if you display it on an outside wall, sometimes that can form condensation depending on where you live. Uh, you don't want to uh, display it near windows or on windowsills just in case you have those windows open and um, accidentally forget to close them when it's raining outside. And you also don't want to store them in or display them in the kitchen or the bathroom because of steam um, and other condensation that forms from those areas. And something that I learned um, from one of my conservation mentors that I really like to tell people is don't forget about grandma. Um, chances are, if you're storing or displaying your taxidermy 
and other family heirlooms or valuables in a place um, where you wouldn't let your grandmother take a nap, then you need to move it. So you wouldn't put your grandmother under a pipe that's known to leak or in a damp basement or a hot attic or whatever. You want to treat your special stuff in the same way that you would treat someone special in your family. Um, it's impossible to talk about wet recovery without talking a little bit about disaster planning um, and response in general. A basic, a basic aspect of disaster preparedness is that you should have a written response plan. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but there are plenty of resources available that can support you in drafting a plan that is appropriate to the scale and needs of your collection. That plan should involve the designation of someone who will lead a response effort and individuals who can support them in damage assessment and salvage efforts. All of those, all these individuals need to understand their roles and be ready to respond. Also, as a part of your plan, um, you should have identified materials that you are likely to need in the event of a disaster and have them gathered in a safe place or have, them identi or have identified a ready source where they can be acquired at short notice. Alongside your plan, you need to have uh, collection inventory records. To respond effectively, you need to know what you have and where it is. And now, here's Julia. <laughs> Do a little mic transfer. All right, this is Julia. So um, I'm going to pick it up from here for a little bit, and we're going to talk um, about what happens when disaster strikes. So you've done everything that Fran has suggested as far as preventive measures, um, but nevertheless, you come into work, and as you walk through your collection storage area, you see that water is gushing down the wall, and it's four inches deep and rising fast. So now what? <clears throat> well, human safety is obviously always going to be our first priority. Um, so depending on your situation, you may call 911, or you may... Um, contact your internal security or facility staff or someone else. Um, but usually those initial efforts are going to focus on stabilizing the environment, um, getting people to safety, shutting off any possible source of water, um, if there is one that you can shut off, blocking um, the spread of water, um, maybe using containers or plastic sheeting, sandbags or whatever else might be at hand, um, perhaps removing standing water and then inspecting the area for other hazards. Um, and it's after all of that that's taken place that recovery, um, recovery activities can really take over. Um, all right. So in the meantime, while all that's going on, you can be planning and preparing. So um, as, as Fran mentioned, assessment and salvage are really best driven by a, a recovery team that's led by a designated leader. Um, and so in the event of um, a water disaster, that leader should immediately alert the response team to the disaster and ask them to stand by for instructions. And then when it's safe to access the affected area, that leader should probably walk through the area to get a sense of the extent of the damage. And that's really your first opportunity to assess the space and the facility, think a little bit about what materials um, are going to be needed and sort out how you should allocate the support that you have or whether maybe you need to think about recruiting others. And then when it's appropriate to do so, leaders can pull together their team um, and together they can review health and safety considerations, um, your plan for assessing damage, assign roles, um, talk about a plan for salvage, and then begin gathering up materials. Your damage assessment um, should really be a survey that allows you to efficiently identify your affected locations and taxidermy specimens. Um, in our experience um, here, we've learned that if a large collection is affected, a flagging system can be a really efficient way to um, move through a space and identify cabinets, um, shelves, or mounts that have been checked, and then mark those that have been affected by water for triage. We've used um, colored post-it notes to do that, um, in which you know, so that every, every location is examined and then marked with either a red or a green, or maybe you have a third category um, note to indicate whether or not follow-up is needed or what kind of follow-up that might be. Um, an assessment sheet or a log can also be a good, good tool for recording this kind of information, and we recommend taking photographs um, as well. Um, the process can be, you know, can take a little bit of time, um, but it's really important to keep accurate records of the condition and the location of all your collection materials 
um, because it'll allow you to be more strategic in planning your salvage and it also has legal and insurance um, uses. So when you begin your ass assessment, keep an eye on evidence from your environment. Um, obviously, if there's water on, around, or under a shelf or a storage cabinet, there's a greater likelihood um, that the taxidermy specimens inside are going to be wet. Um, so looking on, under, and inside of furniture for pooled water and splashes is, is obviously a good idea, but also looking for condensation, um, looking at absorbent materials like um, housing materials, boxes and trays, drop ceiling panels, um, carpets, and wallboard where watermarks and stains may be visible. Notice any odd odors um, or even the appearance of mold blooms, which um, can show up as um, black, white, or gray. Um, so this is, uh, this is an example of a case where water may be very obvious, like this on the outside of a storage cabinet, or um, in this display case that happened to be sealed, but water still found its way inside. But here's an example where there's condensation on the underside of a drawer inside of a storage cabinet. Um, soaked materials like this may be really obvious, like, such as the, the spalling wall um, and the carpet. This was a um, plumbing leak. But sometimes they're less obvious. Um, I think the housing materials on the right are soaked, but not you know, maybe not um, calling out as loudly. So in inspecting your taxidermy, you're obviously looking for liquid water that may be visible or around a specimen. Also check for dampness. Um, and when you're wearing gloves, it can be a little tricky to check for dampness. So um, you can use a dry paper towel or a Kim wipe that's just gently pressed onto the fur to give you a visual indication of um, whether you have damp fur or feathers. And again, odd odors can be a really important cue. And then when you encounter taxidermy that has been affected by water, we want to observe whether there's um, any damage evident. Um, and so broadly speaking, there are generally four types of, um, four categories of damage that you're likely to encounter. Um, the first is a biological attack. So um, mold is um, the, most, um, the most important example. Almost all of the materials that are used in the con construction of taxidermy um, are susceptible to mold. Um, so you, in those, you'd be looking for um, like a musty smell or evidence of mold blooms. Um, mold can begin to grow in as little as 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then chemical attack is another category. Um, so adhesives and other mannequin materials that, that are used in the construction of the taxidermy may be water soluble themselves or they may, may be water sensitive. Um, you may see things, uh, see hides beginning to detach, uh, softening of mannequin or finishing materials um, like those, um, you know, the, the materials used around the eyes and inside of ears. Um, and then collagen in the skin um, can degrade and turn into gelatin w w if it has prolonged um, immersion into water. So um, you'd be looking for shrinkage, um, sometimes dramatic deformation and changes in texture, strength, and flexibility. You may also see changes in color um, and darkening in the skin. Um, so I'll show you an example of that. This is um, an example that uh, where the skin's really been badly ge um, gelatinized and misshapen after getting soaked with liquid water. Um, you can see it's, it's dark in color and it's pulled away from the mannequin. It's also become really rigid um, and inflexible. And then structural failure. Um, wet skin is, is much weaker, um, so you, you, you'll see damage at seams. Um, where seams have broken open or torn around the stitching. You may see new tears that form at the border between wet and dry areas in a skin or enlargement of existing splits and tears. Um, you'll see weakening in um, saturated ma uh, mannequin materials, which may, may kind of present themselves as a physical instability or even um, a more dramatic collapse of a mount. Um, and then um, labels can also detach. Um, in research collections, in all collections, but in research collections especially, it's critically important to keep objects together with their labels. Um, I, I think I also wanted to point out, like hollow mannequins that derive strength from their um, from absorbent materials that have been layered with adhesives, and bound mannequins are really particularly um, particularly vulnerable. <laughs> 
So, um, and the last category here is distortion of fur and feathers, or physical changes such as dis distortion of fur and feathers, where you'll see um, really damp, matted uh, fur, um, clumped and disengaged feathers, um, and you may see movement of dirt and colorants. So that would that would manifest as tide lines, um, staining. Um, you may see migration of um, paints or dyes that have been used. So here's an example of a um, elephant foot where the seam has actually um, split open, exacerbated by exposure to water. Um, we have a couple um, a couple mammals here where the fur is clumped and matted. You can see some streaks. Um, hopefully you can see them on the kangaroo mount on the right um, and the, the kind of matted fur on the moose's ear on the left. Staining uh, on, the t on a tusk. Uh, this tusk was in a flood, and um, since this was an HVAC-related leak, the dark materials are really likely to be compounds um, from inside the mount itself that were mobilized by the water. Um, and a rather sad bird on the right. And then this slide I just have here as a reminder um, that, of course, taxidermy is often incorporated into objects um, or dioramas that include other materials that are also susceptible to water damage. So in this diorama, we had streaming, uh, streaming water saturating foreground materials. Um, in some cases, the plants were affected um, structurally, and the water turned soil into mud that then kind of flowed into the surrounding um, decking area. So once you have a basic understanding of the nature and extent of damage in your collection, you're in a position to make decisions about how to approach salvage. Um, what the, the aim of wet salvage is really to stabilize collections through a process of controlled drying. And as you're doing that, it's really important to come up with a clear and logical sequence for how you're going to prioritize your salvage efforts. Uh, we recommend prior prioritizing based on value first. Um, and that may not necessarily be monetary value. That may be historical value, scientific value. What are the treasures in your collection? Um, and then from there, prioritize by vulnerability followed by condition. Taxidermy, in general terms, is just a highly vulnerable medium. Um, but that said, some mounts are going to be more vulnerable than others. Um, so here in this chart, I've kind of broken that down a little bit. So you can see that absorbent and bound mannequins are going to be more vulnerable than um, the newer foam mannequins that aren't absorbent. Um, untanned and tawed hides are more vulnerable than uh, full tans. Ivory and teeth, which are very responsive to changes in humidity, are particularly vulnerable. Hairless skins um, can be more vulnerable because intact hair and, and contour feathers sometimes have kind of a, a sheeting effect on water um, and pr prevent it from soaking down into the, into the hide. Weakened and embrittled hides are going to be um, much more susceptible to um, gelatinization um, and may really almost crumble and come apart if they're fully immersed. Um, and then damp housing materials clearly present a, um, an issue for whatever, whatever they contain. But whatever approach you take to control drying, it's going to require handling handling your taxidermy specimens to some extent. So I, I wanted to share some considerations um, to keep in mind um, and some guidelines for handling wet taxidermy. Um, as I mentioned before, the wet materials are going to be weaker compared to, compared to when they're dry and much more prone to deformation and other new structural damages. Um, and saturated, saturated materials can also be much heavier than they look. Um, so as, as you would do when you are handling dry taxidermy, you need to assess the condition before, um, before picking up your mount, looking for old repairs. Um, whenever you can, it's great to handle specimens indirectly using um, trays, boards, or other supports, and try not to move things any more often than you need to, because um, you know, every time an object is moved, that, that's increasing risk. Um, provide additional uh, support during and after movement where needed. Locate the labels and any object fragments and try to keep them together with the specimen from the very beginning. Um, clear your pathway. Handle heavy objects with help when, when it's needed. Um, you may want to salvage wet materials working from top to bottom. Um, and if it's safe to do so, you can leave undamaged, unaffected objects in place. Um, resist the urge to fix objects on the fly. You may see something that's just, just you know, bugs you and you want to fix it. but um, want to keep moving ahead and, um, and you know, 
not be manipulating objects um, on a one-off basis. And then, um, of course, don't forget your PPE. Um, so it's really important when you're working with, um, in a salvage situation that, that everyone's protected from mold. Um, and so that's going to include your protective clothing, gloves, respiratory protection, and goggles. Um, you're, you, we want to ex limit your exposure as much as possible. Um, and people who have allergies or asthma, may, you know, it may be appropriate to give them sl different assignments in the response effort. Um, if you, when you come across mounts where mold has formed, um, we want to quarantine those so that the spores aren't spread to other objects. Um, moldy specimens can be air dried in an isolated space. Preferably that space can be vented to the outdoors or maybe uh, you can vent it, um, you can um, ventilate it using a HEPA filtered air scrubber. Um, so I'm going to outline three approaches to drying taxidermy collections and all of them really aim to arrest mold growth while mitigating um, the other types of damage that I just described. Um, and there are other variations on some of these methods, but I just want to point out that none of the methods I'm going to talk about involve heat. Um, so it's important to avoid drying methods that involve warming the specimen um, or the ambient conditions above the normal range because um, it both increases the potential for mold growth um, when you have high humidity and it also increases the possibility of damage and distortions in your mounts. I'm sorry that this, this is a little bit cut off, but um, so the first, the first um, drying method is air drying um, in which Wet taxidermy is basically laid out in a drying area that you've identified and have um, set up with fans and dehumidifiers. The first, uh, first one of the first steps, you want to remove excess water from your mounts. Um, you can spread them out on tables that you've covered with plastic and then absorbent materials like um, blotter, unprinted newsprint, white toweling. You don't want to be introducing colorants, but um, um, and then you can use those materials to gently blot damp skin and fur um, and even labels so that they um, have a better op opportunity to dry flat. Um, and then when those materials become dampened, you're, you, you'll want to change them out. Um, as, as taxidermy is drying um, or as it becomes wet and then begins to dry, um, you know, you, you will probably see um, deformations and distortions in, in the hide, places where the hide is starting to delaminate or detach. Um, if the taxidermy, um, if the hide dries that way and it's unsupported, um, it's likely to you know, stay in that um, distorted position. So if hide is flexible, if you, if you see the, those um, issues and the hide is still flexible, you, you should gently support um, the mount to try to re retain the original form as it dries. And you can use um, clips like um, hair clips, barrettes, nose clips, gentle pressure um, that um, doesn't dig in, um, but can you, you know that you can use to manipulate. Um, you may want to use um, small weights that don't impede airflow, or you can also use things like cotton twill tape. Um, and then around, uh, around your objects, um, you want to use fans and dehumidifiers to bring the temperature and relative humidity um, as close to normal room conditions, um, ideally kind of pulling dry air into the room and pushing humid air out. Um, and you, you want to monitor um, the effectiveness of your efforts um, somehow. Um, psychrometers are a possibility or data loggers can also be used. Um, we've also um, experimented here with using FLIR cameras um, if you happen to have one available. Um, Benefits to air drying is that it's low, co low cost and really requires little or no specialized equipment, but it's only going to be an efficient um, method if the ambient humidity is um, pretty low. It can be space and labor intensive. Um, it's suitable for salvaging a smallish number of damp or slightly wet mounts, but not for really heavily saturated mounts with absorbent mannequins. Um, and um, you know there's still a risk of, of mold growth, particularly in those wetter um, examples. So this is just um, an image of an air drying situation. Um, you can see some of the mounts um, aren't, you know, could be better supported, um, but the, there's a, a lots of space around all of the mounts. Um, there isn't, they're not using absorbent materials in this image, but there is plastic. Um, here's another example of air drying using a dehumidifier and a fan. Um, ideally, you'd arrange the equipment to try to encourage a directional airflow 
Um, a better option for taxidermy that's moderately wet or has to be left in situ um, is sometimes drying with dehumidified air or desiccant air drying. So that this involves um, a controlled drying enclosure that's used to exhaust humid air and replace it with dry air with um, dehumidification equipment and fans or HEPA filtered air scrubbers. Um, setting this up usually requires partnering with um, an outside vendor um, that has access to the equipment and the supplies. Although it can be, you, you can rent equipment and set it up yourself if you know how. Um, the ch uh, this chamber can be constructed in situ around collections, um, for example, in a diorama situation or if you have something that is um, too large to move. But it can also be set up elsewhere on site or off if, there's, um, if, if you do need or want to move those collections. Again, you'd want to remove excess water and provide physical support. Um, and the area really, it, the ceiling of the area is important um, to maintain a lower humidity that permits um, a, a more efficient air circulation than air drying alone. Drying with dehumidified air is faster than air drying. Um, and as I said, it's suitable for um, objects that you may need to leave in place. Um, it also may allow you to uh, dry a larger quantity of um, wetter mounts. Um, there is still risk of mold growth um, in mounts that are large or have absorbent materials or are heavily saturated. And here's, an, here's a um, picture of what that might look like. Um, so you can see that the, the, the diorama in this example has been sealed off with um, plastic sheeting that's taped, taped all around the edge. And then the, the kind of taller dehumidifier in the foreground is um, feeding air into that space via the angled tube, and then the air is being exhausted by the uh, kind of more squat air scrubbers that are um, at either end of, of the diorama. All right, and then the third approach that I'm going to talk about is um, vacuum freeze drying, in which wet specimens are frozen and then later dried by means of sublim sublimation. Um, freeze drying requires partnering with one or more outside vendors. Um, wet specimens in their housings are frozen um, and then moved to a specialized vacuum freeze drying chamber where they're placed under vacuum and the temperature is closely controlled to sublimate ice directly into gas. Um, freezing will, uh, will arrest mold growth, so this is, um, this is an approach that, um, that is you know, used when um, it's really important to um, immediately stop um, the possibility of mold. But on, for taxidermy, there's a much higher likelihood of damage um, to the collagen, to teeth and bone um, that may be preserved in the cr um, cranial um, and postcranial um, uh, components that have been incorporated into the mannequin. If there's wood in the mannequin or um, other components that are partially or completely saturated. Um, so when other methods are not available or, um, or unsuitable, uh, freeze drying will reduce the potential for mold, mold infestation, but I think it's really important that those benefits are weighed against these potential damages. It wouldn't be my first choice. Um, and now I'm going to give it back to give it back to Fran, who's going to talk a little bit about cleaning. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Um, in our final few minutes that we have here, um, I'd like to talk about uh, cleaning, some dry cleaning. Um, we feel it's important to talk about this because it's a need that comes up in all taxidermy collections, including those that have been subjected to water events. So right now, we're mostly talking about things that haven't gone through a disaster, but, um, but if you had had a small water event and everything feels dry, then you can also um, employ these techniques. Ideally, we'd always recommend that you consult with a conservator before executing a cleaning procedure because even the safest methods can cause irreversible damage um, in some cases. But we realize that particularly in smaller institutions and private collections, there may be financial or geographical barriers that make contra uh, contracting a conservator difficult. Um, so we're just going to touch on the dry cleaning methods, which tend to be the safest. Um, across the board, the best way to clean is to test in a small, discrete location first. Um, and you need to understand that not all parts of the mount will respond in the same way to your cleaning techniques. So of course, um, stop if you observe damage and then consult a specialist. Um, in general, you will encounter three different types of dirt, and some of these methods lend themselves better towards one type um, over the other. So there's the dusty dirt, um, there's a greasy dirt, 
And then there are dry films and stains, especially after water. Um, we always like to use, as I mentioned earlier, the HEPA filtered, filtered vacuum, and then we use a soft bristle brush, and we brush the dirt and dust into the vacuum. Um, you want to use your vacuum on a, um, if it's variable speed, you want to use it on the lower speed, and you will cover the nozzle with a screen or a cheesecloth um, just to make sure that it's protected. You don't want to suck up anything that you didn't realize um, was loose. And then there are other areas um, that some of the harder components of the taxidermy um, where you could use things like Webrol cotton pads or um, electrostatic cloths or disposable rags, which are basically soft paper cleaning cloths um, to kind of wipe away that dust uh, very gently. And as of course, as anywhere, you want to test first. But um, in these cases, you might risk um, pulling off slipping hairs or loose feathers or unstable fragments. Um, so we always like to use a, a brush to begin with. And there are different kinds of sponges that are available, especially soft white cosmetic sponges that you can buy and then soot sponges that are specifically for fire damage. These are much more aggressive, obviously, than the wipes and pads, but um, they're really, they can be very effective on greasy dirt. Um, and they're really good on the harder components. So I saw there was a question about um, elephant tusks. Um, if you want to try to clean a superficial um, a deposit on a hard surface like an elephant tusk, then you could try the soot sponge or the cosmetic sponges. Um, and in some cases, you might need to add um, water, but we would rather that you uh, talk to a conservator first before thinking about doing that. So we have a um, video on cleaning some mammal mounts and a bird mount. If um, Sarah can move the screen for me. Okay, I'm just sharing my screen and then we'll start this one. And once again, I'm going to um, speed it up so that um, can fit in everything. So you see I have all my supplies gathered. I have a pretend taxidermy mount, which is a coyote skin. Here's my HEPA vacuum that I have on low setting. And then I'm going to come over and Vanna White. I have my gloves on. Let's slow it down a little bit again. Um, there we go. So those are the cotton pads. Um, I showed you the electric static cloth before this. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, there we go. There's the electric static cloth. It's kind of thin. You can cut it to how you want. Um, the Weeble pads again. And that's cotton, so that's very absorbent. We use that for cleaning a variety of different things. Um, the box of rags, they're very soft. You can cut those to shape as well, and you can use those to help support your animals. Those are the soot sponges that you can cut to different sizes, and these are the cosmetic sponges that you can also cut. Um, we like to use a variety of different brushes. My personal favorite is um, the fan brush, just an artist brush that you can buy, and that's because it kind of grooms the hair while you're working on it. Um, here's a piece of plastic screen that I'm putting over top, and I always have hair bands, so I just use those sometimes. You can use rubber bands um, to attach it on top. And I'm going to brush in the direction that the hair and the feathers grow. If the hair is stable, then you can do a little bit more grooming, and you can brush in different directions, um, but just test that out. And you'll notice that I'm brushing um, with the vacuum parallel to the surface. I'm not actually putting it on top of the specimen, on top of the hair. So there's that guy, and then I'm pulling over a piece of caribou hide, and it has some, some uh, hairs that are falling out, so it's a little bit more fragile. So instead, on this one, I'm going to take my plastic screen and gently place that on top, and then kind of run the vacuum over top of that um, to get any loose um, dust that's coming off of it. And then um, if you feel like you need a little bit more agitation, sometimes you can take a brush and um, go over top of it, but um, you'll just have to test it out and see what works. And then I will show the final video that we have, which is this really quick one on bird cleaning. So the same kind of thing, my vacuum is on a low suction setting. I'm holding it not directly on top of the feathers, and I'm brushing in the direction that the feathers grow um, to get that dirt and dust off of it. And then as an added bonus, um, our favorite thing that we like to do when we're cleaning taxidermy is to clean the eyeballs. So this is a wet technique that we will show you. Um, I have my little glass of water on the side, 
and um, some Q-tips, or we call them cotton swabs. So the first one, I'm going to dip into the water and then wipe off the excess, and then gently rub it over top of the eye to um, get any dirt and grime that's off of it. So you move that around and go around the edges, and then I can do kind of a, a final polish um, by taking a, a cotton swab that isn't dipped in water. Okay. All right, and we'll go back to the presentation. Perfect. Um, and finally, when to call a conservator. So you've had all this stuff happen. Um, this is our uh, don't try this at home section when we give a warning. Um, we don't want you to try the um, wet cleaning methods. Um, they can make it a little bit more. Uh, the dry cleaning sometimes isn't very effective, but wet cleaning can go awry very quickly. Um, so it's better to talk to someone uh, who has a little bit more experience um, cleaning those. Um, and then common household and hardware shop materials um, don't often work. Um, they might be ineffective or worse, they might cause new chemical or structural damage. Um, there are many different options for how to um, restore a damaged piece of taxidermy, and there are ethical choices that um, we think about that reflect the preservation goals as well as that artistic and historical, scientific, or other values uh, that surround the, speci the specimen and the collections. Um, and so we often work with the stakeholders of the collections to determine appropriate treatment approaches. And there are also um, structural repairs, particularly in the mannequin, that can require significant intervention. Um, and you need to have a really solid understanding of construction um, and materials in order to even try to um, work on that. And we don't just work um, with conservators, um, and we also work with taxidermists. There's often a confusion on when you should contact a taxidermist versus when you should contact um, a conservator. Um, taxidermists bring important um, skill sets to the table, and many of them are accomplished wildlife artists and sophisticated naturalists. A skilled taxidermist might be able to restore damage very quickly and with impressive accuracy. But the key thing to remember is that not all taxidermists um, are equal with this because um, many of them lack experience restoring taxidermy of historical significance and they might not prioritize the original materials and construction methods. Um, which is important because if you have a mount that was mounted by Teddy Roosevelt, you're going to want to keep that because the importance is that it was Teddy who, who mounted it. Uh, a taxidermist skill set, uh, it's also best suited to the materials that they regularly use. And some of those might lack the long-term stability and reversibility that um, we prefer in conservation. So, you know, an, an aged hide will um, respond differently to um, the environment than a fresh one will. So if a taxidermist isn't used to working with aged um, components, they might not really know uh, the special considerations. It's important to talk with any taxidermist about the materials and methods that they propose um, and to consider whether, whether they're compatible with your preservation goals before you work with someone. In our experience, um, it's worked out really well to partner with a conservator and a taxidermist on projects of importance. Um, but fear not, uh, the last thought that we want to leave you with is that before you consider anything a lost cause, you should definitely consult with a specialist because many damages that appear to be a total loss can actually be addressed quite successfully um, by, by specialists. Um, the top pieces in these photos are pieces that were um, in a fire, so they're covered in soot and they had water damage. Um, so the before treatment are the top photos and then the after treatment are the bottom photos. Um, of course, if you need help, um, feel free to contact me or contact Julia or both of us. Um, if you need help finding a conservator, you can go to AIC's website, um, which is where you signed up for this webinar, and there are find a conservator options there. But you can also email us um, to see if we know of any people who work on taxidermy who are in your, um, your region. Um, we'd like to thank all of the institutions who have shared the case studies today, and we would especially like to thank Linda Diebenhausen, who helped us um, with some of her case studies that were really phenomenal. And of course, our interns who helped all along um, some recent projects who were featured in some of the photos. Um, so thank you everyone for listening. I don't know if they're gonna want us to respond to questions now or if we will um, have perhaps like a blog write up or send out some emails. I'm seeing maybe a couple questions coming up.
that's fine with us. Um, we could hang on for another couple, few more minutes. Okay. Hi, Julia. Yes. I have. Um, we have six questions from the attendees, and I can ask them in the order in which we receive them. If that's okay with you? Yes. Okay. Um, the first question is: Can you recommend a good source for litmus type tests for arsenic to test mounts currently in a collection so that they can be flagged for safety if necessary? Yeah. Um, we didn't get into this today. Um, the kits that I know of are the spot testing. Um, they actually require the use of some pretty heavy duty chemicals like hydrochloric acid. And so it's best to do um, with someone when you have a conservation lab or someone who's used to handling those chemicals. Um, I think that they did used to sell some kits, but there have been some back and forth on how successful they are, if you can get them, and how long of a shelf life they have. So um, I think I need to do a little bit more background research before um, talking about that. And there are also um, analytical techniques to use, such as x-ray fluorescence. Um, and they are very expensive pieces of equipment, but um, you can often borrow them from institutions who have them. Um, I think that question was asked by the person in Colorado. Um, I bet that there's probably an XRF unit um, at the Museum of Nature and Science in Denver or at the Art Museum. So you can ask people to come and spend a day or an afternoon looking at many different mounts. Um, you can also check out the history um, uh, that woman, she wouldn't be able to do this, but if you're in an, a museum, you can ask around for people who've worked there for a long time if they remember people using um, pesticides or look for things in storage. Julia has something to add. I just want to um, add one note, which is that um, you know our collection at the museum, um, we don't we don't do a lot of um, object by object testing. Um, we know a little bit about how certain parts of our collection were treated historically, but in practice, we've decided that the most pragmatic approach is just to assume that everything is contaminated and then um, approach everything with, you know, that level of precaution. You want to throw oh. me another one? Yes. So that's the next question. Um, is there a specific velocity for drying in the air drying process to avoid more damage? And in an arid environment, would you just air dry without the fans? Hmm. That's one that I will I will have to kind of do a little bit of research before I go and uh, answer based on my intuitive uh, and my my you know limited experience. Um, but I can certainly follow up on that. Okay. One more question then. Uh, is it possible to freeze items in, in a normal freezer without causing too much damage? And would an industrial grade freezer that gets uh, to at least negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit suffice? Um, my understanding is that if you need to freeze things, um, a, uh, a freezer that goes to about zero um, Celsius is, is preferable. Um, I don't think that one can say that you will necessarily avoid damage in doing that, though. Um, I think that that's going to remain a risk. Um, and I, I don't know specifically how that risk would um, change if you go to a lower, t like if you needed to use a lower temperature simply because that's what you had on hand. But I don't think that there are, um, in terms of um, mold, I don't think that there are benefits to choosing the lower temperature. Um, that's another thing that we can, you know, we can try to provide a little bit more information about. Okay. Yeah, we would recommend drying first. As a, as a preferred approach over the freezing. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have time for any more questions, or shall we address them elsewhere? Yeah, why don't we, why don't we follow up in, in um, some other format, if that's okay. 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 Well, thank you, Fran and Julia, and thank you all attendees for joining us today. We ask that you please take a few minutes now to complete the brief evaluation survey linked on the screen, and you can find more information about both FAIC and NCPTT on their websites. Thanks so much.